I want to introduce you to uh, Dana DiTomasa, who is a partner at Kickpoint, an agency out of Edmonton, um, who I guess is our second international speaker at Confluence. Hey, we gave a round of applause to Glenn. It would be rude not to give a round of applause for that too. Second international speaker. She bridges the gap between digital and traditional. A brand is really at the core of what she speaks about. I saw her speak at MozCon two years ago, and um, she just killed it. And I was sitting there just with my door open, loving what she was saying, so much so that afterwards, at, at the after party, um, I kind of went up to her like kind of a dorky English guy and said, oh, oh that was really good. It was my favorite one. Um, and at that point, Confluence, you know, it was, I think it was still a twinkle in daddy's eye, honestly. Um, <laughs> And I had never dreamed that she would be here, um, but it is with great pleasure that um, I invite to the Confluence stage the final speaker of today, Dana DiTomasa. Good afternoon. I heard it's a little steamy up here. Are you guys okay? Yeah? All right. It's nice and cool in the speaker room, so sorry. We can all troop down there later. So if I ask you, what is your brand? What comes to mind right now? Everybody in the audience. You're probably thinking about you know, your logo or maybe your like, nice letter-pressed business card. We have one of those. Or maybe it's like your social media page or this cool illustration that you did or a piece of content. And for sure, it includes marketing, but your brand is more than marketing. Your brand is all of these things. Your brand is the speeches that people give on stage that represent your company. Your brand is your products that you sell. Your brand includes things like your billboards, your letterheads, your publications, the emails, how your invoices go out from your accounting department, the way that people feel when they walk into an event that you're holding, the way in which your apps how long did they take to launch? How long did they take to load? Are they frustrating to use? Is it a slow internet connection? No, that's not our fault. Mm, kind of is. I mean, think about how Instagram got around that particular limitation. They did a really good job of that. Um, it's a way in which you handle your public relations. It's the things that your CEO says that might make you feel a little bit gross about using Uber, for example. All of these things are part of your brand, whether you like it or not. And so, as marketers, we need to think about all of these things. There's my first Canadian about of the day. There will be many more. Enjoy them while you can. I, I really put it on extra for you guys. So. Um, so people will say to me, well, Dana, you know, like, I can't control how the vehicle department drives their cars or, I, you know, the customer service department, that's out of my hands. So part of what I want to talk about today when I'm talking about your brand is how do we get all these pieces together and working in harmony to drive a stronger brand. Because humans, bless our poor little reptilian brains, we really like consistency. We like things to be matchy-matchy, right? You want to have a matching outfit. You want to have things that feel consistent. You, there's a reason why chain restaurants are so popular. You go into one and you know that it's going to be the same. And even, you know, you're talking about the hipster district, you know, even when I pick, say, hipster restaurant, you have a picture in your mind. There's now a brand associated with hipster restaurant. There's a chalkboard, there's charcuterie, there's some guy behind the counter with a bar, who's bartending, and he's got his sleeves pulled up, and he probably has, like, the wrap thing around his sleeves, and he's wearing one of those old-timey aprons, and he's got a big mustache, right? Like, that's hipster restaurant. Now, that is the brand of hipster restaurant. And because we go there because it's comforting, because of the consistency. We don't like surprises. And Yelp exists and has helped to bring back the independent restaurant movement so that we're still having a surprise without having a surprise. It's that consistency that's coming back into our lives. And so marketing works when it feels right. Marketing that drives sales feels good when you engage with it. It, it. It's setting the right chord to the market that you want to attract, right? Like even the Old Spice ads, which are ridiculous and over the top and everybody likes them, but it feels right for the brand. But if they had gone from like Old Man Old Spice to now, that was a difficult transition. 
when they first put, in, put out those ads. If they went back now, people would be confused, possibly scared. And I think that that's part of what's become of their brand now. They had a really difficult transition to make and they, they managed to do it quite successfully. And now they're creating that consistency in their ads. When I say Old Spice ad to you, this is what you picture. You do not picture the Old Spice ads of the 1980s, which I still vaguely recall in my mind. You have a consistency associated with that product, which is tied to their brand. So if I went around to each of your companies and I talked to 10 different people and I said, tell me what your company does, would I get the same answer or would I get 10 different answers? That is also your brand. And I would actually encourage you to go back and do this fun little exercise at your company. It's also kind of fun if you get like a friend to call in, random people at the company and ask them questions. We've done this as part of uh, research when we're putting together brand strategy and just call and pretend to be like a clueless customer. So what do you guys do? See what they say. And your brand is your promise. You have a certain expectation, right? Like that hipster bartender is gonna make you a drink that was made in like originally 1920, right? And there's gonna be some sort of story and it might involve like prohibition in some way, right? There's an there's a expectation. I, I go to a lot of hipster restaurants. <laughs> Hipsterism is an epidemic in Edmonton and my wife really likes cocktails, so we go to a lot of hipster restaurants. Um, so I have a real expectation what it's gonna be like, but that's the promise when I go there. So if I go to a hipster restaurant and I order a Manhattan for my wife and they say, oh, I don't know how to make that, ooh, right? Like that's, we need to go now. Like something is wrong here. But that's the expectation that you've built. That's the promise that you've built. And marketing is building a promise and perhaps the company isn't delivering on that promise. Um, and at MozCon, when I talked about brand, I told a story about that promise. Um, were peop people here at MozCon, I don't wanna bore you with the same story. Really? All right, then I'm gonna tell it because there's only like two of you. Okay, so <laughs> we had a client uh, that we worked with past tense, and it was a manufacturing company in Edmonton, um, and don't tweet too much of this in case you're watching mentions. <laughs> um, anyway, so they were, they were a manufacturing company, and they manufactured a thing, and then somebody else installed the thing, and I don't want to say what the thing is, just, <laughs> but the problem was that we were doing great work bringing in tons and tons of leads for them, and so they were selling a lot of those things, but then when it came time to install the things, horrible, like massive problems, huge bad reviews, was not a cable company or internet company in some way, although that would be a really similar metaphor to this, right? Um, what I did talk about at MozCon was Comcast and how it has to be very sad to work in marketing at Comcast because <laughs> nobody has a good time at Comcast, right? Um, so this was like that in that people had a certain expectation because our marketing was so good, but then the actual experience was so bad. And so we went back to the client and we were like, Everybody hates you. It's actually affecting your sales now. We can see that people are Googling your company name sucks, your company name reviews, your company name problems, you know, your company name installation problems. What can we do about this? Can we give these people a fix? Can we give them money so they can pay for a fix? Like, no, we can't do any of that. And it just kept getting worse and worse. It's like, you've actually lost more money in sales than it would have cost you to pay the customer to fix this problem in the first place. And they wouldn't do that either. And then you just start to feel gross, right? Like, like you're marketing a crappy product. And I imagine that you know all of us at some point in time or another have worked at a company or had a client who was not necessarily, the promise was there, but the actual product wasn't there. <laughs> and it just, it, it, you're not having a good time. It's not something that you want to do. And so we eventually had to cut them off and let them go. And uh, actually, uh, I was at a meeting the other day at another agency, and lo and behold, this company is working with that agency. And I really want to say to them, like, how is it going? Because I'm, I'm really curious. Um, I didn't mention it. I'm working up to that. But it, it felt so much better when we let it go because it's like, we can't fix you. And eventually, long term, people are going to figure it out. And they're going to have to make serious changes in their organization but they've lost all this time by wasting time and not getting involved right away and saying, does our brand promise match our reality? In their case, it didn't. So 
you know, you say, oh, brand strategy, this is all very well and good, but um, I have some AdWords ads to optimize, or I really need to run this Facebook campaign, or I have to write this blog post. I have, I have other things to do other than brand strategy. And I imagine that if you go to a client and you say, hey, this month we're gonna do brand strategy, and they're gonna say, we would prefer money. So hopefully for the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna give you some ammo to help you realize brand strategy within your companies and with your clients, and how to sell them on this idea, which I guarantee will make things better for you. So brand strategy does drive ROI. Uh, Ruth and I were actually talking about this earlier. Both of our companies have undergone a bit of a rebrand, and we're getting way better leads. Why? Brand strategy. <laughs> you talk to companies who have made things better in their organization in terms of diluting their brand down to something specific. You've talked to companies who have decided to make sure the promise matches the reality. And their ROI is so much better. And it's a painful process. So of course it's hard. Of course nobody wants to do hard things. We all want to do, you know, work for an hour and then go to Facebook for the rest of the day and have a beer, right? Like brand strategy is hard and it takes a lot of work. So people shy away from it. But it does drive return on investment. Your brand strategy encourages customer acquisition. Who doesn't want someone with a giant sack of money coming to buy a mobile phone, right? Like, brand strategy makes it easier in that customer acquisition piece because your sales team understands the kinds of things that are driving your customers and they're also able, they don't have to ask themselves what would the company say or what is the company's position on this. They just know because that's part of brand strategy. Your team, it's so much easier to put together a team and, you know, People talk about hiring for culture. This is a huge thing now, hiring for company culture. If you don't know what your brand is, how can you figure out your company culture? And even companies that do have a really well-defined culture still struggle with hiring for culture and the kinds of things they say. I think there's some companies out there that do a great job at understanding brand and culture. You know, Moz is a good example of that. They have a very specific brand, they have a specific culture. Slack is another excellent example. Um, they, actually it's really interesting, here's a good example of different company brands. Moz put out a post about diversity at their company. Slack just did the same thing today. Read the two, compare and contrast. You can really see the difference between the company cultures. One is not necessarily better than the other, they're just different. But the culture really shines through in the ways in which they present the data. I recommend checking that out to kind of get a sample of the two. And of course, this digital strategy thing, which drives everything that you're going to do, is the distillation of your goals, your brand, your organic, your content, your social media, your paid. Design stuff too, there's a whole bunch of other, we, we ran out of little, it was gonna be too small, no one would be able to read that, so my art director had to put a stop to it. But there's a lot of stuff that goes into making that digital strategy, and your brand is important, as is your goals, as is everything else. It really drives part of it. And I also want to encourage you, when you're thinking about doing digital strategy, don't say, stop everything. We have to go and do this brand thing. We have to go and do this digital strategy thing. You can also approach brand as a step-by-step -step process. And you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to stop everything for three months and don't proceed with any other marketing because the marketing choices that you make can also help drive the decisions about how you're going to implement your brand strategy. So I recommend this is not a stop and hold on thing. This is a part of the process thing. So let's get started with doing that. First thing I want you to do is start with your core values of your organization. So many of you probably have a mission statement, you know, or some sort of, and hopefully it's not like one of those really long ones that talks about like synergies world-class, market-leading. Those are great things that say nothing. And <laughs> I love when we talk to companies, and they're like, we uh, aim to provide the best customer service. I'm like, I hope everybody does. Like, who's gonna be like, we totally have mediocre customer service. <laughs> nobody, <nobody's, laughs> nobody else has written that. If you have, good for you for owning that. Like, <laughs> nobody else has written that, 
in their brand. What's that? Honesty is the best policy. Exactly. Like if you're struggling with something, maybe don't, you know, maybe work on that. But nobody nobody writes that in their thing. So we were working with a home builder and they had this thing about, you know, meeting uh, stand building standards. I'm like, yeah, you have to. <laughs> or they won't sign off on the condo. Yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> and Edmonton is having this uh, epidemic right now, really, of bad condos because we had a big oil boom. And so all these builders came in and built a lot of crap condos and then there were a lot of problems with you know, leaky condos and everything else. Um, and so talking about the fact that you meet standards is a thing, but really I want to know like extra things, like is it going to burn down? Like am I going to get kicked out of my place for 12 months while they reseal the envelope, the building envelope? So there's ways to express that without saying meets code, which is a basic standard for existence. <laughs> so think about that as well. And, and that also, like, where in that spectrum between, you know, really trying to push it out there or bare minimum is your company going, well, that also determines what your brand strategy is going to be. So imagine your company is a person. And, uh, we're talking about Don Draper just a moment ago. Um, I know all the marketing companies are always like, oh yeah, we're totally Don Draper. But <laughs> people aren't perfect and companies aren't perfect. You can't have the good parts of a company without the bad parts of a company. So if you really want Don Draper to be your company's you know, avatar, then you have to take the drinking, the total unpredictability, the incredible sexism, everything else that comes along with Don Draper. You can't just have the every once in a while he comes up with a totally brilliant idea situation. So companies are flawed, people are flawed. You're not gonna be perfect, own what those issues are. So um, these are finally <laughs> the brand attributes for Kickpoint. Um, and it took my business partner and I quite some time and many, many beers to come up with these. And the way in which we did it at our company, and I'm sure that internally, like if you work at a marketing company, your own company is like the last client who ever gets any love at all. That's what happens. And for us, what we had to do is we asked ourselves questions all the time. Is this kick pointy? Is this something kick point would do? And we actually have a persona for our company, Lady Kickpoint. And Lady Kickpoint has a really specific personality, and it is not any of our own personalities. It is Lady Kickpoint, the avatar of Kickpoint. And so these are her attributes. She's honest, she's knowledgeable, she's pragmatic, she's open, and she's engaging. But those can also be seen as negative attributes in the sense that honesty, not all clients want you to be honest with them. We're really, really honest. If you're doing something we think is dumb, we will tell you. Not all clients like that. <laughs> we find out. <laughs> Usually we try to cut that off at the past before they sign something, but sometimes it, people get through. You know, being knowledgeable, right? One of the things we're really, really proud of is that we keep up on the industry, we speak at conferences, we blog, we try to give back to the community. We have a lot of knowledge about our industry which puts us in conflict with other agencies, especially in town, who you say things like, oh yeah, you know, build like 50 links a month and that'll, and then we tell them that they're wrong. You know, so it's knowledge, it's a fine line between knowledge and knowing it all, right? And then pragmatic, you know, understanding and accepting the circumstances that we have and saying, well, that's nice, but, you know, here's your budget. <laughs> Let's be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you think that this is your target market, and maybe it is, but you're only spending $500 a month on PPC. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to up that budget, going back to the honesty. Open. Not all clients are comfortable with the fact that we do write and talk about case studies. Some clients, we have a clause in our contract that says, if you work with us, we will write a case study about you. Yes, you can read it first, but it's going to go up on our website. You know, client being last. We haven't written all the case studies yet, but <laughs> um, but we have that in there. And so that's part of our openness. And it's part of what enables me to be up here on stage and talk about the different things we've done with our clients. It's part of our culture. Again, not all companies are comfortable with that. And engaging. We kind of harass you a lot. So if, in, you know, some, some clients, and if you work in-house in an agency, you'll know this, some clients are like, I'm going to give you money, and then you give me marketing, and I don't want to talk to you. Right? Those are not good clients for us. There are other companies out there who that is great for, and I'm happy to refer them on. That's one of the first things that we ask. So, that, so now we've begun to define what makes a good Kickpoint client and where Kickpoint is the best at working with this particular type of client. 
So for your own companies, as you start to define these brand attributes, you need to look at the positive and the negative of how it could work out for people. And the other part of it too with brand strategy is that somebody at the company has probably tried to do this before. And there's probably like a skeleton hidden somewhere in a dark, damp cave. Some poor person who's like rocking back and forth at their desk when you say brand strategy. So find out who tried and failed and why. You know, it's like uh, Indiana Jones and, uh, oh crap. Indiana Jones, uh, the, the, the last real one before the aliens. The last Crusade. Last Crusade, thank you. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I don't count the Aliens movie as being a real one. And <laughs> Greg and I can talk about that more later. Um, and you know, here's all these cups and here's all these corpses of people who have chosen the wrong cups before, right? There's probably that happening at your company. Find out why that failed. Maybe they didn't get buy-in from the C-level and was like, hey, I made a brand strategy into a drawer, never to be seen again. Or maybe the company wasn't ready for it. Or maybe this happens a lot, there's institutional um, issues within the organization, you know, the different silos don't want to talk to each other. Maybe there's somebody who's worked there for 30 years and is like, well, this is how we've always done it. So go away, whippersnapper. I don't <laughs> want to talk to you. There's lots of different reasons why it could fail. And so understanding and figuring out how you're going to mitigate those issues before you get going can really, you're going to have a better time for sure. Also work on the brand is and the brand is not statements. This can also help to distill down what your brand truly is and is not because people are also really good at figuring out like what things are not more than they are what things are. So what I recommend for this exercise is take a bunch of those brand attributes I had for Kickpoint. They're all you know adjectives basically. I hope they are. I'm terrible at grammar. They're words that describe things. Um, my wife is an English major, so it freaks me out when I try to like talk about grammar things. I'm sure she's thinking that I'm wrong right now, <laughs> following along on Twitter. So this is uh, a brand for a wedding uh, invitation company. This is from a post that Erica McGillivray from Moz did on the Salesforce blog. I recommend checking, you, checking it out. It is an excellent post about how to come up with brand voice. But what this is, is a result of a card sorting exercise. So you have like 40 different cards out. Each of them has a word written on it that describes or does not describe the brand. And get people from the company and don't focus group this because there's always like one loud mouth who will just brain the group in to go in this direction that they believe in. You don't want that guy. So do this individually and go around to people and say, pull out a couple things that say, this is what the brand is not. This is what the brand is now. This is where the brand could be. And that can really help you start to get to their brand strategy. It can help you get to those five attributes that I mentioned earlier. And five is just a number that Jen, my business partner, and I picked. It does not have to be your. You do not have to have five. You could have three. You could have seven. I do not recommend more than like 10 because that's too much. But this is a really good introductory exercise for people at your company. And the results may surprise you. And agencies, I also strongly encourage you, do not let your own bias color the results. This client, it's their company. At the end of the day, they're gonna have to live with that. You don't necessarily have to. So don't try to push them in a place that you feel like they should be if they're not ready to be there yet. Don't try to color the results or push them in a certain direction. Let the company come to their own understanding as to what it is that they are. Because I know we're always like, want to see our kids grow up and become plumbers and engineers and, you know, it's, it's okay. Just let, them, let it happen. So as a result of these is, is not statements, then you can start to define voice and tone. And a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking that voice and tone is all it is when it comes to brand strategy. We have a document about how we talk, and that's all we need. We don't need anything else for brand strategy. Good day. Thank you. It's more than that, so don't fall into that trap either. I had a slide about that, sorry. <laughs> so this is a screenshot from a real live brand voice document we did for a client. This client is in an interesting space. They are an email service provider, which is not a crowded field at all. One of their main competitors is MailChimp. Their big competitive difference is that you can pick up the phone and call them and they actually do the templates for you. 
as no extra charge as part of it. And they have a really interesting billing system that makes them really good for large institutions like universities, for example. So they're called industry mail out. I really, they're fun guys. So <laughs> as a part of this, um, we went through their website and we wrote like, you wrote like this. Here is why that is bad. Instead, you should write like this. Don't just grab their examples and put them under not like this. There must be one or two ways in which they've got it right before they knew they were getting it right. Because really, there's nothing a client loves more than a document that says you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. So try to have some positive reinforcement in there as well. But try to lay out what the issue is. You know, This consistently wows customers. Like That made us roll our eyes pretty hard, but this is why. Instead of just looking at it and saying, oh, this is crap. It's like, no, you have to explain why that is bad. Because they don't, they don't know. And so our brand voice and our foundation documents really helped us come back with this and saying, here you go. And they took that right away. And literally that afternoon that we delivered it, they changed their bios on their social networks. And they started rewriting all of their content. And they started tweeting in a different way. It was immediate. And so it's amazing to see how quickly these changes can get implemented. They were, they were hungry for a brand document. They just didn't know that that's what they needed. But keep it simple. Yeah, there's a, you know, with the brand document that we delivered to Industry Mail Out, that was like three pages in total. And it was a lot of work that went into those three pages. It's actually harder to write a short one, short document than a long one. Uh, another client of ours is the Chamber of Commerce in Edmonton. And we gave them the brand document and it was three pages and they're like, you forgot to print some more pages. We're like, no, nope, that's it. And I think like they had a little tiny heart attack <laughs> because they're used to making these huge documents. You know, like their policy on minimum wage is like 40 pages long. It's like, but this is our driving document for our organization. I'm like, yep, no one else is gonna read it if we make it any longer. That's how long it is. And that was, that was tough for them. So keep it short, keep it simple, keep it digestible. You don't want it to be so gigantic that it ends up being this dusty PDF as in a file somewhere that nobody ever opens. And speaking of which, no more PDFs. We are digital, PDF is a print thing. Stop it. <laughs> we have strong opinions about PDFs. Um, I particularly hate PDFs for white papers, um, especially if you're like 50% like of people are using the internet on cell phones. PDFs are crap on cell phones. Why do you do that, you know? So try to make it, if you can, make it a microsite. Make it a subdomain off of your website. And then it's a living document. Um, the government of uh, the United Kingdom, their style guide and brand guide is not a PDF. It's actually a website that anyone can go and look at. Same thing with MailChimp. I believe Buffers is also totally live. These are really good examples of what a brand guide can look like when it's a live website. So. All that being said, I have, okay, I'm doing good on time <laughs> for what I have left. How do you sell this to your client? And how do you sell this to your boss? Because I'm, I, they're kind of the same thing. You know, it's uh, your client is in some ways your boss and your boss is in some ways your client. So I'm gonna go through some tactics that you can use to go back and, and I'm sure at least one of these pain points will be something that you've noticed. And if wrong, you know, talk to me. I'm here tomorrow as well. Um, talk to me and I will definitely help you come up with a plan to sell this when you go back to work. So small companies, tiny little companies are founder driven. Until you have a brand voice, that founder is the face of the company. And making that transition from the founder taking a step back, the company growing to a point where they, the founder can take a step back, or even the founder this personality can even halt the growth of the company. So an example I have of this is a personal trainer that I know. And his personality is so tied with the brand that nobody wants to work out with the other trainers at this company. They only want to work out with him. And there's only so many hours a day he has for that in addition to running the company. So it's really stagnated the kind of growth that he can have. So founders, Bless their hearts, you know, myself, my business partner are one. It's sometimes it's hard to divorce yourself from the company. The creation of Lady KP or Lady Kickpoint is part of what helped us divorce us from the organization and really helped it grow. Big companies need direction. Really big organizations are scared and they don't necessarily want to change things and they feel like it's a lot of work and so things just stay the same and they end up floundering. And there's a lot of fear when you're talking to big companies. 
about these sorts of things. They get really, really scared. So try to dig in as to what those fears are and then address them individually. You don't think so-and-so is going to be on board, how are we going to handle that? It's too much work, how are you going to handle that? We just read it our logo, go back to what a brand is. <laughs> There's lots of different things you can do to try to, it's, it's a longer process, but it is worth it in so many more ways than it is with the small company. And without brand strategy, your company doesn't know what it's doing. It doesn't have a plan, it's just doing stuff. It's like saying, get me more traffic, but your website is terrible. It's like you just spent all this money on mobile ads, but your website isn't mobile friendly, right? You're just gonna stagnate, you're not doing anything. You're literally wasting your money. And what separates you from your competitors? This is another good question to ask. Without a brand strategy, what makes us different? This is especially true in a really competitive industry like it was with my client, the email service provider. What makes you different from MailChimp? And they knew, but they weren't expressing that. They could articulate to us what the differences were, but they did not express that in any of their documents, in any of the ways in which they talked to people. They were basically trying to be exactly like MailChimp in their communications. There is a MailChimp already. You do not need to be that company. And maybe you're losing customers due to bad brand alignment. Maybe, you know, it's like if you get a phone call, if, if Kickpoint got a phone call from somebody and all we got were phone calls from people that said, I want to rank number one. I'm like, well, there's lots of companies who do that. What about, you know, your brand and bringing together digital traditional? They're like, I don't care about that stuff. Like, then we would be doing something wrong in our brand that we're attracting the wrong kind of customer. And we call this marketing debt in that you're wasting your time with clients who are never gonna sign with you, who are bad clients. You're actively losing money as a result of these kinds of uh, people contacting you. So don't waste your salespeople's time. Get a brand strategy, only attract the clients that matter. Is service dealing with angry customers? Going back to the manufacturer and how they had so many angry people. Isn't your life so much better when you're not spending half your time on the phone with service people getting yelled at? Your turnover will go down. Your, you know, everyone will be happier in general. Like your life is going to be better. And coworkers who aren't team players. Well, how can you define who a team player is if you don't know your culture, which is a function of your brand strategy? Not being a team player can just be code word for we're not all friends. When really, until you have that brand strategy and that culture that comes from that, then you can start to understand what really makes a team player in your organization. And again, marketing without purpose, without a brand, without that strategy, you don't know the purpose of your company. You don't know what your company's promise is, so how are you expected to market to that? You can't. Brand strategy fixes all of these things and more. It helps you market with purpose, it helps you bring forth the things that make your company unique, and it helps make your company stronger as a result of it. So I hope all of you have a really good time putting in your brand strategy. Thanks. Dana, thank you very much. You occupy, well first let me say, I need to adopt the brand guidelines of the government of the United Kingdom for myself. <laughs> Just any piece of communication that yeah. I do, I want it to be how the Queen would do it. Um, secondly, <laughs> You, op you occupy a really great space, um, which is uh, right here within branding. You're basically taking digital and you're mm -hmm. taking this, um, this age-old art of, of marketing mm -hmm. and branding, yep. um, and you're bringing them together. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something, that's a, that's a personal challenge for me. That's something that I'm trying to do for myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested to hear where you're getting all this great insight from and how we can grow in this way. <laughs> uh, we read a lot of websites. Um, I'm also president of the, um, uh, the Advertising Club of Edmonton, so I hang out with a lot of traditional advertisers. So in town, um, we have uh, DDB, which is a big multinational advertising company. We also have McLaren McCann down the road in Calgary. There's a lot of like big agencies, and so watching how they work is really interesting because they're really good at some things and they're really spectacularly awful at others, and we're able to see what they're missing as a result. So like, for example, a lot of uh, marketing, we were just talking about this before I came on, 
a lot of people were talking about like, look at this cool stuff that advertisers are doing. Why aren't, why aren't SEOs doing this, right? And it's like, well, yeah, we can totally do this. The difference is that A, you know, the advertisers get these really sweet budgets because they're better at pitching. So I recommend uh, reading The Art of the Pitch in general, just because it's a really good book about learning how to sell things and having people say yes when you ask them for large sums of money. Um, also, Selling the Invisible is a good one. Selling the Invisible too. is also a good one. I enjoyed Art of the Pitch because it teaches you a little bit more of that like stalkery stuff that you think is weird, but it actually mm. helps you win business. I like, like I that. totally did not think it was going to work, and then it did. I'm like, well, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'll do this then. Um, but the difficulty is that like maybe they're really good with ads, but their execution is really crappy. Right? Like they could do, they could just totally misread the market. Like, why would you do a TV ad for millennials? Right? Like, it's just they don't have cable. You know, they, they maybe they're watching like TV at a bar if it's sports, but other than that, they're they're on they're on Facebook, right? Or if you're marketing to teens, like advertising aimed at teens that's on television, <laughs> you are doing it wrong. You're just wasting. You're literally wasting your money, right? You might as well just take a client out to lunch and you get more results out of that. And so they misread the execution on a regular basis. And so I think that one of the things that as digital marketers to extend into this realm is that you can take it, making great creative is not rocket science, right? Like it's, it's very much, a, a lot of the advertising agencies are like, don't look behind the curtain, right? But good creative directors, good art directors, good copywriters, all of these things are accessible to us. There probably are good creative directors, you know, who aren't necessarily thrilled with what they do, but you need to bring focus to what the result is going to be. And so that's the difference. And um, an advertiser said to me once, um, a good creative gets results. And I was like, yeah, just magically. <laughs> <laughs> like just on its own, good creative gets results. And I, and I disagree with that statement because I feel that execution is the part that's underrepresented. And what we are really good at is executing. If I say to you, okay, so I want to market a yoga vacation in India to women, like you're already like, okay, so this is the Facebook group. You know, this is the Facebook ad I'm going to put together. Here's the interest, right? You just need that solid creative. You know where to put it. It's the creative part that's missing. And you have the data to prove that it worked or it didn't work. Yeah. And you, you know the answer to this question. So You don't have to talk about things like impressions or reach or any of those metrics that we know are crap that people use on a regular basis to try to sell the stuff that's happening. That is awesome, by the way. <laughs> um, actually, well, and you mentioned you were at my MozCon presentation two years ago. That was about reporting. It was not about brand at all. Uh, and so I would recommend, it's a free video, if you look up the MozCon 2014 videos, um, and I would recommend watching that one too because it can really help you figure out how to report in a way that makes your clients, A, stop talking about rank reports, because rank reports we all know are crap, and two, can help you start to get the clients to understand what metrics matter and what don't. So you guys, you shared with me at uh, KickPoint, you recently onboarded a creative director. Yeah, art director. Uh, an art director. Yeah. And uh, would you mind sharing what that's done for you. Oh, it's so amazing. Emma's the best. Um, Emma did all the cute um, illustrative slides. Um, she designed her website, she did her business cards. She came in, she's like, this is all shit. And she fixed it all. <laughs> uh, and I think she said that she's from New Zealand. She has, the, uh, she has a great accent. So just picture her saying that in New Zealish is what we call it. Um, <laughs> but what Emma has really brought to our organization is the ability to be able to execute on creative concepts in a way where we would say, well, that would be really cool, but we don't have a designer, so we're going to do this instead, right? And so to be able to say, like, hey, I want to run these Facebook ads. One of our clients is a bridal show. And I, before, it would be like, OK, well, I'm going to do some Facebook ads, but oh, I don't know what kind of creative, and here's a picture that I found, and let's just run this, right? But instead, I can say, hey, Emma, I want to try to do a Facebook ad where you tag your bestie that you're going to be bringing to the bridal show. And so we tried like four different ads, and it was the one with the shirtless men that worked. <laughs> you don't say. You know we kind of knew. Oh, well, actually, it was another one that tied for first with the shirtless men that we were really surprised by, because you never really know. But to oh. be able to, and, and then to say to her, OK, so these two worked, so let's do some refinements on these. And then like, just having them come back so quickly and to be able to do that kind of rapid fire testing with graphics in-house. You don't have to like, wait for the client to get back to you.